Welcome. Thank you. So first, a few notes about what Peerless is, because many of you didn't know. I'm told some of you tried it before we actually started. But Peerless is a community that wants to make security better, faster for cybersecurity defenders of every type and color globally. The way we do that is by, we have a community that for many years now has been writing blog posts. We gamify creating the best ones, promote them to official resources that go into wikis, topical wikis. And then the entry point for every security professional on the list should be the meta wiki, the wiki of wikis, from which you can drill down and find whatever you need. So on peer list, people like they write a post, but it's not like elsewhere. You write a post, and then someone suggests something, and you're like, hey, that's, "You're right. That might, that might be right." But peer list, if someone does, that, you edit your post and you add whatever respects and make your post better, hmm. so that you get posts that continually, continually evolve and get better and better. That is the community spirit, and one of the very early contributors, always of high, high quality, is Gary. Hayslip, who's with us today to present. And Gary is now the CISO of WebRoot. And please, Gary, introduce yourself and let's do this. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, as uh, as Paul said, we uh, when we originally started with, uh, with Peerless, you know, I looked at it as a way for the community for us to be able to share information. And usually what I would do is I'd post something on LinkedIn and then I'd also post it on Peerless. You know, where I find things on peer list that I thought were of interest, you know, that I thought that, you know, you know peers and other people on LinkedIn would find really interesting. And so I would go ahead and share it. And so it became kind of an interesting relationship going back and forth with them, you know, from the beginning. And since then, they've got a couple of ebooks and we've added a lot more, uh, you know, content. And so I, I continually um, go ahead and work with them. So what we're going to talk about is. The, uh, this was a talk that I was going to go ahead and do at RSA, but uh, the RSA decided they wanted to go more technical this year. And but I look at it from a from the community standpoint for for CISOs on how they are building their teams and how they're basically you know trying to keep their best asset, which is their team members. You know, and they're trying to hire their people and, and keep them on what they should be looking for. And so I'm going to go ahead and kind of walk you through some of the stuff that I've been doing this for about 25 years. You know, what I look at when I'm building teams and how I'm hiring people and, you know, skill sets and certain things that I've found are really critical for teams to be successful. So, who clicks? How are we going to click? Do you get the click over there? Okay, cool. It's my finger. Okay. So, we'll do this. So, first off, I'd like to go ahead and start with some numbers, which I found, you know, quite interesting. Um, right now, you know, of course, we all know that, you know, in the, in the, in the cybersecurity community, there's supposed to be a job shortage. And the job and the numbers run anywhere between, you know, a couple hundred thousand to like two million. You know, I think it's like two million worldwide. In the United States, uh, this is actually came from NIST. Uh, NIST, uh, the number one right there, is stating that it was about 286,000 cyber-related jobs that were open and not filled for at least a month or longer last year. You know, which is actually quite a lot. You know, and then when you go and you take a look at it in the state of California, that's almost 32,000 jobs that stayed open in the state of California, and roughly about you know about 4,200 jobs in San Diego that are open and unfilled. You know, and then the um, one of the organizations I'm a member of in San Diego, the Cyber Center of Excellence, we started, we actually did an economic impact study on cybersecurity for the economy and the community there. And what we found with about 110 different companies was that there was about, you know, uh, almost 8,600 people employed in San Diego County that their jobs are related to cybersecurity, you know, which actually is, is quite large. You know, we were really surprised to find out how many companies are employing, you know, security personnel. Because typically the maturity of a company, you usually don't hire or start hiring security people until you're about two or 300 employees. And so that was, you know, those numbers really surprised us too. Next slide. And so then the next thing we looked at was, and this is, I think, where for a CISO, you have a lot of trouble going ahead and trying to keep your people. And we're basically a CISO's kind of joke that we steal from each other. And the reason is, is that nationally, you know, when you look at the unemployment, you know, I mean, you know, nationally, you know, it's about a three or four percent job growth. But in the security field, like in San Diego last year, it was almost 15%. And 
and cybersecurity, that, that kind of a growth. And they're actually projecting in San Diego, it's going to be about 13% next year. When you're dealing with that kind of job growth and that kind of competition for, you know, um, for staff, it really, you know, you have to be cognizant of what you're doing with your people. You know, because I, I, you know, I have found that on the, the very minor occasions when I have lost somebody to one of my teams, typically it wasn't just money. You know, typically it was because of, it was money or it was a mixture of money and the fact that they hated being in their cubicle and they wanted to do things different. You know, it was a career issue, progression-wise. You know, and those are things that I should have seen. And as a CISO, I should have been able to have provided for them. You know, and so they, you know, it was time for them to leave and they left. And then some of the last things we thought was really interesting was you've got over 8,000 cybersecurity jobs in the region, but there's twice as many supporting them. You know, there was over 16,000 IT-related jobs. And so we, we averaged it out. It was like almost about 1.8 IT personnel per cybersecurity personnel, you know, which was kind of interesting when you start taking a look at it. And so you start saying, okay, if cybersecurity keeps growing, you know, the IT staffs and a lot of these other support staff are going to grow with them, you know. And so it was just, you know, we were, you know, digging into that. We decided the next year's numbers we wanted to dig into that more to kind of understand that impact. And then the last thing we found was that it was basically about $2 billion, you know, uh, worth of economic growth in San Diego just from cybersecurity-related jobs, which equates to about 14 Comic-Cons or four Super Bowls. You know, I mean, Comic-Cons are ripple, but I mean, you have 14 of them. That's kind of huge. Next slide. So we're going to, you know, for me, the whole discussion really is, is talent, is understanding your people and the skill sets, what we're bringing to the teams, or what you need, what you're short on, and then being able to manage it. I've known CISOs that were exceptional at this, and I've known CISOs that were just little train wrecks at this, and so they were constantly, you know, they had a you know a revolving door with their teams. You know, and unfortunately, when you have that happen, it's it's a lot harder to be able to get projects done on time. It's a lot harder to actually build out a security program. And honestly, you do in, end up impacting your company, you know, because they're relying on, you know, the security and the risk management services that your team should be providing. Next slide. So, okay, there we go. So the way I look at it, you know, when you're building teams, it's really around, there's four factors that I look at. You know, one of the first ones is you're developing your hiring priorities. You're kind of establishing a baseline. You know, every time I've taken a CISO position, I've come in and I've worked at an organization, I very rarely have ever found that the job descriptions actually match what my people are doing. <laughs> you know? Or I very rarely have had HR really understand how to hire cybersecurity positions because they just assume cybersecurity is like IT. <laughs> and it's not. It's very different. You know, and then another thing too that you know that I find is that there's a whole technical and soft skills piece that you really need to go ahead and take a look at, especially soft skills when you're when you're matching up teams and you want to go ahead and make sure that there's a good fit. You don't want your team members trying to kill each other. They have to be able to work together. You know, cybersecurity is one of those kind of jobs that's not nine to five. And you tend to kind of work weird hours together. You do very interesting projects and troubleshooting and you know dealing with incident response. And you have to have team members that can go ahead and work well together. And then some of the other things I look at is you know, training programs, you know, the skill sets, the different types of uh, experience and stuff that your teams have, you're going to have to put some type of program in place because cyber's constantly changing. And so the requirements, the needs that they are going to have to have be effective, you have to be able to take that into account. And so you got to build out a training program. And then the last piece I look at, um, there's metrics that I usually recommend to so see are you effective or not. So, I mean, you know, you're spending money. You know, I mean, I report to the CFO at Weber. You know, I want to be able to go ahead and tell him, be able to show him that the investment that we're putting in my teams are worth something, that we're actually bringing some type of value. You know, because security teams don't typically drive revenue. Instead, we provide services that make the other teams that do revenue, you know, we're able to protect them and make it easier for them. And so you kind of catch those type of metrics to be able to show that. So next slide. So the first thing I look at from a hiring priorities piece is, again, I go ahead and I start talking with HR, and I'll pull together the list of what positions do I have on my team? What positions do I have responsibility for? 
you know, and then I dig into those positions. And some of the things I start taking a look at are, okay, I've got this many analysts or this many engineers, but I'll get into the job description. What kind of experience should they have? Is there any certs that are recommended? You know, and that's my beginning because it gives me an idea how old these things are. You know, the next thing I take a look at is my security staff. What type of technologies are we currently using? You know, and then in working with my uh, with my teams, I start asking them. You know, from a service standpoint, what type of services are we providing our uh, our fellow departments? You know, what are we actually doing that provides value? And and then we start jotting you know, all these different services so I can better understand what my teams are doing. You know, they're not just sitting in their cubby every day; they're actually doing work. Well, what is that work? What are we doing? You know, and then from that, you know, I also will talk with stakeholders. I'll talk with other departments who were serving. And I asked them, you know, I want to find out, you know, is there other things that we're doing that we didn't capture? You know, and do we suck or do we, you know, what do you think? You know, I mean, there's things we could be doing better. I want to capture from them maturity-wise where we're at. And then, you know, from that, I basically have the positions, I have the technology, I have a good idea of services, what we're doing, you know, and from that, I'm also starting to get together the kind of skill sets that would probably be required to be able to do those services. Next slide. And so then comes the fun part. I've got to, you know, I've got to check the accuracy. So what I'll do is I'll actually sit down with my team members and I'll ask them, okay, these are the services that you're stating that you guys are doing. You know, what skill sets do you believe you need to be able to do these efficiently? You know, so we'll start breaking those down. And then I'll ask them, okay, grade yourself. Where do you think you're at maturity-wise for this? And what, of course, you know, I take in the human factor, you know, because I'm, you know, most people – don't grade themselves low. They try to give themselves the benefit of the doubt, and that's fine. You know, so I'll take their scores, and then I take mine for how I think they're doing, and I average them, and I'll use that as a baseline until I have you know more data to collect. But that gives me an idea, you know, skill sets where my um, where my teams are, you know, from a maturity level. It also gives me an idea that I might be missing. Um, the last piece there, the piece about expecting change. Your organization itself, as you're putting this together and figuring out where your teams are at, your organization is going to drive a lot of this. You know, you may have compliance issues. You know, now you've got GDPR. That's all of a sudden changing things that you weren't ready for. You know, your organization may decide, you know, hey, we want to be competitive, so we're going to go ahead and get ISO certified. Well, now that's a whole different thing that you've got to go ahead and take a look at. You've got to be flexible enough and expect these changes. You also have to take a look at from a technology perspective you may have to change things out on your stack. You may want to upgrade some of your technologies. That's going to require different training, different skill sets. Are you, do you want your guys to go ahead and do some certifications? You know, so the men and women on your teams for some of these new technologies you're bringing in. So what you put together here isn't in stone. It just gives you a place to start, just the beginning. Next slide. So one of the first things I do after I put this together is I go back and I talk to HR. You know, I, and what I find is they're actually really receptive. A couple of times I've had to do this, but the biggest thing I try to explain to them is that cybersecurity isn't information technology. It's very different. Yeah, and I tell them, you know, when you really go ahead and boil cyber down, it's data and risk. It's ones and zeros, and it's how the data is being used. Who has access to it? You know, what happens if we lose it? Kind of impact the organization. So when you start building that in and getting them to understand that. Because it drives the skill sets questions. It drives the experience and the certifications that are required. They're very different than if you were hiring a network engineer. You know, and so I, I go ahead and I kind of explain these things. And then I use that to then update my job descriptions. And I use that to update, okay, where my staff should be. At. And then if we're going to go ahead and be hiring, you know, new people. If I get, you know, FTEs, now I have something that's more current. You know, and I have a good idea, skill set wise, what I need to be hiring now because I understand the technology that we have in place and where my teams are at maturity wise, you know, and what I want to bring in and marry with them. Uh, next slide. Mm -hmm. And then the next piece, you know, that I, you know, I go ahead and I take a look at here is again, I review <laughs> the inventory that I've done on the skill sets because I want to make sure I capture this correctly. And we spend a lot of time going into this because one of the things that I'm looking at is, when you go through this, not all skill sets are created equal. You're going to find that, you know, I've had uh, team members who were very immature in some areas. And it's like, you know, it could be seriously, 
be detrimental to the organization. And so you start taking a look at, okay, and start putting together a training program. This is going to be one of the first areas we have to cover. We have to fix it. You know, I need, I need, you know, more of a middle ground. Like, you know, if you're putting in brand new Palo Alto firewalls, you need some people that are familiar with that type of a security platform. And they're ready for that. Or if you're putting in an orchestration platform like the MISP or something, which is going to require scripting, and none of your people really have experience with doing Python or JavaScript scripting, you're going to have to send some people some training. Or if you've got some FTEs, you want to hire some people with those skill sets. You know, so you start building this out here. And then again, as I, you know, one of the last things I start taking a look at is the soft skills. Soft skills to me is probably one of the most important things that I run into when I'm managing teams. I've managed teams of five people or teams of 50 people. And I really look at fit, how you can fit them together to be able to go ahead and have efficient work you know, from them so they're not spinning their wheels fighting with each other instead they're actually getting things done. I can trust them to go ahead and deal with customers. I can trust them to deal with my other departments without me having to go in and constantly put out fires. You know, and so I take a look at a lot at the soft skills piece. Uh, next slide. And so I'm actually going to list some of the soft skills that we look at. You know, I find um, when I'm hiring, when I'm building out teams, these are specific things that I'm trying to find, you know, uh, with a lot of my team members. You know, the time management piece. You know, you're working on contract. I'm not on contracts, but I'm like, you're working on projects. You're working on different issues, and you get specific time. You know, your teams have to be able to work together and understand that you just can't drag this out forever and procrastinate. You have to deliver. You have to get things done. You know, the uh, some of the integrity, you know, is a very big thing for me. You know, one of my biggest pet peeves with my teams is I explain to them, this is cybersecurity. You're going to break things. I have no problem with that. But you own it. You know, you own it, and we go ahead and figure out how to fix it. You know, come up with some other options. We go on about our business. Don't lie about it. Don't try to blow it off on some, it's somebody else's fault. <coughs> if you broke something, if you caused an issue, you own it, let's move on. You know, I'm not going to eat your lunch on that. You lie to me, though, you only get one or two of those and you're gone. I'm not going to, I can't trust you. And it really impacts the team because now nobody is going to trust you because you just put the whole team under the bus. You know, so it does it. What I've found, I've seen teams blow up over stuff like that. And it gets really, really bad. You know, and some of the other things I look at, Stress management, that's cybersecurity in a nutshell. If you're dealing with stress, you know, you're dealing with incidents. Uh, problem solving, you know, curiosity. There's a lot of times where you're uh, you're culture. You're working on, you know, different types of technologies. You're trying to link them together with APIs. You're trying to share data. And you've got to, you know, have that, you know, that curiosity and just that, that, that love of technology. Because otherwise you're going to hate this job because it is not a nine-to-five sitting in a cubby. There's constantly different things going on, and it constantly shifts. And so I look for people that they're okay with that, that they can work in teams, that they have a progression that I can see over time that they've learned new technologies. You know, because I'm looking for that. You know, from an uh, from a team perspective, when you put people together like that, they can get quite creative. And they can get things done, and you don't have to babysit them so much. Yeah. Um, next slide. And then some of the technical skills I've been looking at a lot for teams. Typically, I don't see people coming right out of school with a cybersecurity degree and they immediately start working in cyber. Typically, they end up coming from you know other fields, other domains. You know, I mean, I started in software development, got into network engineering, got into audit, got into forensics, started running security teams. So I got a little bit of everything. You know, and there's a lot of us that are senior that have been around here a while who just weren't in security. We started in other fields and. We just kind of wound up in security. And so that's what I look for when I'm you know, talking with teams and the technical skills is I'm looking at the different areas that they've worked. You know, because I want to have a better idea when we're dealing with projects and everything, what kind of skills do they bring to the table to round out teams, you know, as you put your teams together. Next slide. And so after I've collected all this information, what I start doing, and, and for some of you that are military, you're gonna start laughing. This is an 85, 70 slide. Um, what I start doing is I want to be able to go ahead and track where people are at, you know, where they're at, because I want to know what kind of training I need to provide for them. I want to know um, career-wise where they are at, because I want to help them in their progression. You know, and I just don't want them sitting still and not moving, not doing anything. 
You know, and so one of the first things, like this one, is for a particular job. Like if they were a security analyst or a security engineer, I would actually have the services and the experience and the certifications that I would expect them to go ahead and have. And I would actually track them. You know, and over time, I would go ahead and, you know, work it with them in one-on-one -on -one discussions, what areas they need to work on, what search they need to work on, um, because I want them to progress. You know, and so I would go ahead and keep track of this for each one of my team members. Next slide. And then I also do the same thing for teams. Is I also build out a matrix like this for teams too. It gives me an idea when I'm looking at my teams where they may have maturity issues, where I may need to move somebody from another team to round them out for a project that we're going to work on. So I'll actually track these too, and supervisors get graded also. You know, I even will even track myself as to where I'm at and things that I need. I think I need to be working on. And so I build these out, and I use this next slide. <laughs> You know, I'll use this to start putting together a training program. Because what I look at, you know, for my staff as I am hiring people and managing my staff is now I've got a better idea the services, what we're providing and what we're doing in the organization. I've got a better idea from a technology perspective where our current stack is. You know, I've got an idea their experience levels, where they're at, and areas that they need help in. You know, and then I'm also one of the biggest things I'm a big proponent of is that. CISOs need to be extremely active in the business, on the business side. You should be talking with your peers that may not be you know, technology related. You need to understand what the business is doing, what the core strategies are for projects that are going on, because you're going to be supporting them. And you need to know these things so that way you've got a heads up when things change, so then you can shift yourself. And so it's it's one of the things that I you know kind of talk about how CISOs tend to have you know, one foot in the technical side and one foot in the uh, in the business side, you need to have both so that you can go ahead and, and you know, honestly take care of your teams and adjust your security program as the business changes. And then, you know, the last piece, I start looking, you know, future state, where we're at and things that may be coming that I need to adjust, especially if there's compliance issues or things like that, you know, because, you know, like when GDPR was coming, we started preparing for GDPR, last March, because we knew there was going to be a significant impact. We knew we were going to have to put a data governance program in place and a lot of things that were going to, because we operate, and again, we operate in Europe. So, you know, we were already planning for that ahead of time. You know, so all these things will tie into how you build your teams, how you manage your teams, how you train them. Next slide. Oh, you have to click it. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that. There we go. And so what I, what I start doing when I put together the training program that I'm going to go ahead and manage my staff, for the first three, I'm looking at career path. Where are they? You know, I want to know where they're at. And, you know, I may have a somebody that would be like a senior technician. They've got five years of experience. So they should be about a senior technician level. But I realize when I really look at their experience and what they've done, they only really manage two pieces of equipment. <clears throat> So even though they got five years of experience, they're probably junior level. And so that lets me know, looking at them, okay, I need to help them get caught up, you know, not be with the, where their peers are at. And so I, I take the experience level, you know, so that lets me also know when I'm looking at my team members, where they're at in their career path, could they possibly be leaving? Could they possibly be outgrowing us and it's time for them to move on? You know, some of my senior people are ready for their first deputy system position or their first director in security position. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I'm not trying to keep my people there. I'm just trying to make sure when they're there that they're effective, that they learn, that, you know, we work well as a team, that if it's time for them to move, it's time for them to move. You know, but, you know, so I factor in where they're at, and then the next thing I look at from the business side, I look at the technologies we have and the changes that are going on, the compliance issues, and I start factoring in, okay, they're going to need training, you know, we're going to have to do a dance course in GDPR. I that they're really important. And then we also, uh, the big piece here, the last one, I like doing the 80 20 rule. You know, 80% of the work that they do is for the business, 20% is for themselves. You know, I'm asking my teams where one team takes Tuesday afternoons to do what they want. 
and one team takes Thursday afternoons to do what they want. So if they want to work on their OSCP certification, if they want to go ahead and, you know, learn, you know, Python and be playing with stuff, that's fun. That's their time in which they can do something to better themselves or work on projects. But what we're actually starting to do now for those that are doing that is once a month on our security meetings, you're going to brief it. Yeah, you because know, you know, you, you may be, you know, kidding me that you're doing something. Well, I want you to brief it. You know, but otherwise than that, I find that that is, you know, my staff really like that. They like being able to go ahead and have a little bit of time to work on something, to work on something different. You know, and some of the other things I do is I go ahead and we schedule in our training program that one certain one event, you know, per year. So if somebody's working on one certification. Um, we'll pay for that one certification and then one event. Like I take my whole team to DEF CON. We all, we're all, we always all go to DEF CON together. You know, but I also find that like my AWS security guys, I'll send them to AWS reInvent. You know, and then I'll have, you know, some of my team members that support, you know, the staff that are doing stuff with sales or something like that or Oracle. Then I may send them to one of those events so they can get a better idea of that community and what they're doing. You know, so we try to factor in and make sure that they definitely go to events and that they're, you know, working on some type of circuit or some type of education, you know, and uh, and we work those in and we go ahead and, you know, what we pays for it. I want to make sure that, you know, from a continuing growth perspective, they're just not sitting in a cubby that they're actually actively working on something. You know, and then again, we uh, also pay for online training. You know, and I even, uh, you know, we'll pay for like, you know, we'll buy a, uh, like a block of licenses, you know, we have a whole bunch of online courses. And what I find is I actually thought my staff members, you know, a lot of my team would be doing some of the technical training. And I find some of them are doing some of the business training, which I, thought, which I think is kind of cool. But, you know, and I think the reason is, is that our, um, the way we're building out our program, we're extensively working with the dev teams and with a lot of the other, you know, different, um, you know, business units. And so I think some of them are just trying to get up to speed on a different language that they're not used to. You know, and, uh, you know, I kind of recommend it, but I'm not going to make them do it. I just thought it was interesting that some. System, again, has a whole track of classes. And so what I try to do, you know, for my staff is to provide them, you know, multiple options for education, for training, you know, for career growth you know, within the teams, because what I want to do is as we hire these people and I, you know, fit the teams together, you know, for the projects and the things that we're working on, I want to give them you know, multiple options to where they want to stay. You know, and then they have room to be able to do different things. You know, I don't want to go ahead and get them into a box where, okay, they're doing, you know, they're working on firewalls and that's all their job is and they never do anything else. You know, that gets old very quickly. You know, honestly, you keep somebody for about 18 months when you do something like that. After about 18 months, their fund meters pegged and they usually leave. You know, you end up burning through people pretty quickly. You know, you want to get more options. Next slide. And so the last piece, as we put this together, we start looking at metrics. How are we going to go ahead and measure how effective this is? These are more operational metrics. What I'm actually, uh, obviously, you want to be measuring these before you start doing this kind of stuff. Because you know, what you're hoping to see is, is a shift. You're hoping to see a trend over time that your teams are getting better, that they're responding to incidents better, or they're responding to tickets better. I've even done one better. We're starting to do surveys. So if we go ahead and we're closing out tickets for various departments, we'll send them a survey. You know, I want to know from a customer service perspective, how are my teams doing? You know, uh, you know, they can't go ahead, you know, and you know, be asses about something and just have an attitude. No, you're providing a service. Yeah, you know, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm looking at that, you know, and especially you know when you're doing evals and everything like that. I want to know: Do you understand that you know there is no such thing as stupid users because stupid users are the reason why we have pay there. You know, so no, you know, we serve them, and that's the reason why we have a job. Yeah, you know, they, you know, a lot of their projects come up with very interesting risk issues where we have to get involved, you know, or governance issues where we have to get involved. Otherwise, we don't have a job. You know, so it's it's a big thing that we take a look at. You know, 
I take those surveys and match it up with this kind of metrics data so I can show when I'm talking to my boss, <laughs> John Post, who's the CFO for one group, when I'm talking with him, I can show him progression on where we're going. You know, and he can go ahead and see when he talks with my fellow VPs and the other departments that, yeah, they all of a sudden like the security teams because <laughs> you know, we're actually providing value. You know, and that's the thing that, you know, because again, you know, security doesn't provide revenue. We provide services to the teams that provide revenue. You know, so it's a it's a thing that, you know, a bunch of my team members have had to totally shift. You know, and so, and that's you know, the way we operate. So next slide. You know, so basically it's three pieces. You go ahead and you evaluate current state where you're at and what you're going to need. You go ahead and you build a path, put together a training program so that you start, you know, giving your teams, you know, a chance to go ahead and grow. And then the metrics piece is you measure it afterwards and go ahead and see how well you're doing and if you need to make shifts. And it's basically three pieces. And no, it doesn't take a couple weeks. This does take a while to put in place. Next slide. I think that's it. Uh, questions? Two week timeline. <laughs> no. No. Um, Honestly, the biggest piece, like with the skill sets yeah. and collecting all of that, that honestly will probably take about six weeks on average. If you want to talk with the departments, you want to go ahead and get an idea where your teams are at. Um, you want to go ahead and spend time observing your teams before you do your one-on-ones and you actually talk to them. You know, usually it's, it's about a month and a half that you kind of put that together. And then, you know, and then there's a couple more months that you start putting together, you start figuring out training, you know, what you're going to need. And then start to get budget and everything. So that's what I'm it's usually it's about three to six months to put in place to get it up and run. Yeah. Yes. What's the, what's, what's the mix on soft skills to, to technical skills that you prefer? Do you, do you need the soft skills in place and you can teach the technical skills or vice yeah. versa? Or is it 50 50? Yeah. I can't teach somebody to take a bath before they come into work. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. not my job. You, you, you know. yeah. it's just a, yeah, you know, I, honestly, um, for me, it's about for me, it, for me, it, it's honestly about seventy three You know, soft skills are extremely critical. Yeah, and it's like you know, but those savants are just awesome that they can program stuff. But there's a reason why they work by themselves. Yeah, sometimes you need that skill set, but predominantly, I need teams. You know, we operate in teams. You know, and so and you may be weak on one, but one of your team members is better on another, but together, yeah, that's what I'm saying. And you know, you're the wonder twins. You know, so it's like, you know, and that's what I look for. I, you know, I look for those those fits where you can work with each other. And um, and you know, and I've had times where you know you'll have teams put together and you'll have people, you know, that friction with each other, and so you'll move them around, you know, um, and you'll move them around, you'll switch out teams and You'll have to warn them, you know, knock it off, you know, that kind of thing. But it's like, uh, you know, so effective. I think I prefer not. Uh, like, I, I would take some less technical, just, yeah. so, just so they play nice. Yeah. yeah. And, and, right. and I have, I've taken people that, uh, okay, they didn't have the full technical skills that I needed, but I could tell from their resume that they are self taught and they, and they've done a bunch of different stuff and they'll fit with the team and that's good for me. Plus. So I'm kind of get a lot of questions from people having difficulty getting into the security industry, even either moving laterally in yep. or starting fresh out from university. And at all the conferences I go to, like hacker conferences, I see a lot of people who may not be strong on the soft skills. Oh yeah. So how would you open up your security program and your focus on soft skills to more diversity, to let people in who are not strong on the soft skills, who are not very experienced, but who really, really just need the yeah. chance to get started and, and to do this. My thing is that um, you don't have to have the soft skills to a T. You just cannot be disruptive. Okay? And so, I mean, you know, if I can go and tell that, you know, from a team fit, you know, the other team members who are more mature, and help bring you in and help get you up to speed, you know, and you're not going to be disruptive, you know, that's fine for me. Yeah, and, I, and I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, I just recently, uh, I was actually at San Diego State talking to a whole group of, uh, you know, you know, people that are in the IT and doing the cybersecurity classes. And they were the same thing. I'm getting my degree 
but how do I get my first job? You know, and because the degree doesn't equal a job. And, you know, and, and one of them, he was like, you know, him and I had a long discussion where he was going to go ahead and take a help desk job just to get in the company. And taking the help desk job was also going to get him a security clearance. And so he would have that and the help desk job. And then from that, he was, he was willing to pivot and get into the network team or get into the security team. You know, and I, I honestly tell, you know, a lot of, a lot of the college uh, students that I talk to, I almost said kids, but <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely not young anymore. But, um, well, you know, and I, when, I, when I speak with a lot of the students, you know, I, I talk to them, I said, understand that your first job is probably not going to be in security. Mine wasn't either. Yeah. You know goal-wise where you want to be, and you may have to take a job as a developer, or take a job in help desk, or take a job as a network analyst, and you just keep on working to get there. Yeah. I mean, that's the reason why some of my articles, when I did the mind maps, and I was showing the different search where you start out at and everything. It takes time. Yeah, it does. It takes time. The difference, though, is that you know what your roadmap is or where you want to go, and you stay persistent with it. You know, and just understand you're going to have to put it at the time. You know, and honestly, I mean, I, uh, you know, I look at the experience, you know, I gained from working with software development teams and working with sales and working with help desk and working on the network engineering side and all these different things, you know, really helped me as a system, you know, because of some of the projects I get involved with or some of my peers that I work with who are now in charge of those people, but I have contacts as to what they're doing, you know, and then the jobs that they're doing. Who writes the job posting when you need someone? Do you write it or does the HR or recruiting person? I write them. I'm going to hear that their HR or recruitment agency write their job posting. No idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, unfortunately, you know, what ends up happening is, is that they'll go up on one of the job sites, they'll pull one down and kind of cut and paste and add some stuff, but they don't really have context because they don't work in the field. You know, one of the first things I did when we started hiring was, you know, our HR director, uh, Mel said, you know, okay, this is your field, this is what you got, what do you want to change? And so I immediately went in and updated it and cleaned it up because I'm, I'm curious, we get like. Yesterday, someone was, how, how do I do this? How do I get into this field? Yeah. The HR people keep stopping me. I can't talk to them. Okay. You get into the, uh, they want the, uh, the uniform recruit that has, you know, the guy's in security, but he knows how to do dev, and he also knows how to do forensics, and he knows how to, and you're like, there's nobody like that coming around out of college. You know, you want two years of experience, we're going to pay you 40K, but we want you to have 10 years of, of knowledge. Of, you know, that just drives me nuts. Maybe just a quick note because we're actually tomorrow night I'm launching a special job um, section on our site. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would be great to just hear from the people here uh, in the room. Um, one of the things, one of the reasons we did it is we felt like today any other job that doesn't allow me to really match the skills of a person to the job. Um, and most recruiters, even people who call themselves technical recruiters, don't really know the difference between forensics and pen testing and other stuff. Um, how do you guys deal with it today? Uh, because what I'm hearing is that you end up having a lot of people that you actually spend time interviewing that should have never even reached an interview stage. Yeah. Well, honestly, I mean, it's like I. Um... You know, before we even do an interview, I'm looking at resumes. You know, they'll collect the resumes together. I'll look at them, and there's certain things I'm looking for. Yeah, and it's like you know, and if I don't see those, I won't even talk to you. I mean, I'm looking at progression-wise. If you've sat in a cubicle for the last seven years and have not done anything except for that one particular job, you're not going to work well in my teams because I mean, we're constantly doing projects and things like that. And you know we will probably overwhelm you because you're you're not ready for that type of a fast-paced environment. And do you look for a specific product experience because in Sometimes. I think in general, like products are. I mean, it's, it's like I mean, I can tell you. Um, you know, I won't look. Yeah, it really depends on what you're hiring for. I mean, I won't look for a particular type of a firewall, but I will look for. Do you have experience with next-gen firewalls? And do you have experience with multiple types? So that lets me know that you're flexible from a technology platform. If you're an analyst, you're going to look for somebody who has experiences with large scale centers. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Well, yep. Um, so, you know, like you were saying, if you're going to hire an analyst, you know, um, I want to make sure that, you know, you're familiar with different SIM platforms. And where, where do you get most because I know when I look for developers, like I would get the developers on GitHub. Um, but just, you know, uh, insecurity, I think, until now, it wasn't a place for that. I'll tell you, for me, most of the people I get, they're all from my network. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they've either worked for me before, you know, and other security teams, because I know where all of my prior team members are at. And I keep track of them, and I still mention a lot of them. And so I'll pull them from my network or I'll call, you know, fellow CISOs, you know, because we know where a lot of our previous team members are at and we help each other. You know, a lot of times that's, that's what we end up doing. You know, and even our, uh, even our, my HR director, you know, I told him, I said, you know, there are certain things that I'm looking for. It's extremely hard to recruit for. And I already have candidates. You know, and I said, you know, I'll bring them in. I won't do the interview because I know the person, but I'll let my teams interview them. And I'll go with what my team said. So really, almost like the close food. Well, I mean, not, I mean, not really, because I mean, it's like like this fall, I'm going to be hiring cloud security people. Well, I don't, I don't know any cloud security oh, people from my previous teams, so that one's going to be quite interesting. You know, that one I will be reaching out to peers, and we'll be basically bringing in resumes or things I'm looking for. Got it. Got it. Yeah, because you know, you know, I have I have a pretty good network, but there's some areas where I. Uh, you know, I just don't have you know that much experience. Mm -hmm. I think part of it though is that people underestimate, you know, they just severely underestimate the power of, of the network. They don't want to play that game. Yeah. It's like, hey, here's my here's my degree. I should be able to go and get a job based solely on merits. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is, is that eighty percent of the jobs aren't advertised. Oh yeah. So you know, if you don't if you don't have a network, if you don't know people, if you're not willing to uh, to reach it's out and yeah. have information interviews, that's another way to get a job. You know, is to have an information interview with somebody, uh, sit down for oh, yeah. coffee and get to know them so they get a chance to see. That was, the um, you know, the articles that I posted on LinkedIn, the Path of Cyber articles, yes. part one, two, and three. One whole article was nothing like that. It was just saying, you know, hey, these professional organizations, you need to join them so you can meet people to find out what these jobs are like, who they hired, put together some, uh, you know, business cards, you know, because you need, you want to be able to contact people. Get involved. You have to get involved in the community. That you guys are saying most of the jobs are not posted because you know everybody is saying there's over a million openings in security. But if you go on, I honestly think there's, there's a lot more. Like there's like thirty thousand. So there's, where are all these jobs? There's a, the problem is, is that there's what happens is you'll have a job that opens up and you don't know if you're, it's such a unique position or there's you're a specific candidate that it's not something that you really write and put a job on. That's when you start going, hey, I. I know that this guy, you know, he, he was over there. I know he's looking at transition. You know, let's let's have a discussion. And so yeah. the jobs that are out there, the ones, that, the truthfully, the ones that pay, that pay, that pay well, uh, those just rarely advertise. Yeah. Because those are people looking for specific candidates. Yeah. Uh, and they don't they don't accept paper, you know, paper candidates. They accept recommendations yeah. of people they trust. Yeah. And so it, it is. I mean, I've. Like I said, I've seen that across the board. I mean, I, you know, we've been doing this a long time with a lot of CISOs that we know. And uh, and I've had, you know, uh, fellow CISOs that have called me and said, hey, I'm interviewing so-and-so and looking at their resume, they worked for you so many years ago. What do you know about this person? Yeah. But I think part of it, uh, do you think maybe it's because existing sites don't really have that granularity of skills? I mean, you don't find that level of granularity now. Yeah, the well, the thing yeah, I guess the thing that drives me crazy is that a lot of the sites they go by certain buzzwords and they go yeah, by certain, exactly. and that's, that's all it is. Right. And that and that drives me insane. Yeah. Well, see, I think part of it though, you, you, this is the other part that, that I think is, is lacking in the mentorship for people. They have to understand there's two there's two metrics you have to get. One, if you're applying for a company, one is the HR screening software, which you which people can rail about, they can hate. It's a matter. It's, a, it's yeah. just a fact of life for large scale companies yeah. in order to weed out people that don't meet the job rights. So you have to play that game, and then that job, that purpose, of that, that resume is only to get you to the interview. Once you do that, then that's all on you. Yeah, that's a soft skill. And that's and that's where the soft skill kind of lies. You got to be able to talk. You got to be able to advocate yourself. 
That's a lot to ask for the security person, right? <laughs> Your soft skill list was really long. <laughs> I think a lot of people are not good for me. Well, I have a is that, you know, that's where joining ISSA or ISAC or AITP or OWASP, once you go ahead and you join professional groups like that and you get involved in the community and dealing with other practitioners, you start learning. You start yeah. learning how to go ahead and do that. You've got to get involved. I mean, and, and what you'll find is, you know, I mean, I can say like the city of San Diego being hired for that CISO position, they didn't advertise that. You know, I got I found out about that job because I was doing fish tacos and beer with a fellow sister at a startup event. And we all were hanging out together. He happened to state that, you know, hey, the city's looking to hire their first sister. You should apply for the job. Very interesting. Would you do if you could actually uh, use the bunch of skills and get the relevant candidates? Would you go through that? What's that? If you could actually specify the skills that you're looking for. In the level of crime you are looking for, and get people who have those skills, would you look at them? Would yeah, them I mean, I, I definitely would bring them in for an interview. Awesome. Because it's just, you know, what it is the skills and the things I'm looking for is I'm trying to make sure that they're a fit yeah. for the projects and the team yeah. I have. And so I've got people that are able to, you know, meet those things. Then it's like, okay, let's meet face to face. Yes. I'm willing to spend some of my time and my team's time so yes. that we can go ahead and talk. Awesome. The other part that's, that I think is, is key to this is that, is that if you can list all of those requirements, every single technical requirement, and then the guy that you have to hire with you, you have to pay over 200000 Yeah. Right? So there is a there's a negotiation aspect to this where you know, you're giving just a little bit of a taste to determine whether or not they want to be one of them as part of a team. And there's a, there's a skill in negotiating, you know, buying, you know, the, the the lowest amount of pay that you can get someone qualified who's willing to work for that, it seems that's, that's beneficial to them, right? So and that's the reason why you, you yeah. talked about, okay, you'd rather really have them on the higher on the social skills that's and true. lower on the technical skills because you're probably able to afford them. So, you know, then, you know, you'll have them for several years as they go ahead and they get experience and they grow in your teams. And, you know, and hopefully they'll stay with you for a while until it's time for them to you know, move on. You know, and, and, I, and I've actually had that. I've had where... You know, when I was a uh, CISO in the U.S. Navy, I was I had people rolling through my teams about every three years, and it was just you know it was one of them, they would actually move to one of the defense contractors and they move to one of the other commands, but we had such a good relationship. You know, I had really good people that were coming in, and you know they were they were good fits. Yeah. Oh, Christina. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Have you ever built a pipeline? To bring in the young guys, I'm thinking of college students that I've met. I'm like, man, your attitude is awesome. You have the basic certs, understanding what that means. But how do we, you know, if there isn't an IT job, like you said, is there a way to I'm trying to think of, you know, hire them? How do you start them off simply, and can you have a mentor and grow them into that person? Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever done that? The you know, and honestly, that's kind of like the holy grail right now for the security community is how to do that. You know, and I honestly, do you want? I, I can answer this. Yeah. I've actually done that. Yeah. Um, I used to work for a global pharmaceutical company, and um, we used to. Uh, well, I, I partnered with the director that sent over the uh, uh, help desk, and. And as well as their IT bench, so the individuals that do a lot of the you know hands-on, you know more on, on the uh, desktops and laptops and stuff. And we would partner and let them spend a couple hours a week with our forensics team, and also our SOC analysts. So they get because if you think about it, help desk. We talk about the cultural fit. We talk about dealing with people, you know, and having those soft skills. I, I probably had a pipeline of over, you know, six years, probably five or six that rolled right out of my help desk or those areas that what we did was we gave them a certain amount of hours per week to work with us. And then the spots opened up or sometimes I just make a spot because I can tell it's right. And, you know, I actually spend more time negotiating with the um, CIO on getting the help desk director more staff versus me making a headcount request. And we just moved the person over because I was able to justify 
the amount of work that we're able to do uh, to make my team more efficient. <coughs> As so, you're doing that, how long did they feel comfortable working primarily in the help desk role before going, all right, this is taking too long, I'm just working outside? Uh, I never had any look outside because to Gary's point about building the culture, you're giving someone an opportunity that they don't normally have. We talked about how hard it is to get into security. You're giving them a door that nobody else is gonna open for. They, they, they really won't. So the fact you're doing that, you're building loyalty. And once you have that, those individuals will stick around. They will still go and look once they get those skills. But when you offer them a certain amount of training per year, um, my one-on-ones, uh, I would have them with my direct reports and the team, and then monthly I would do it with the staff below my leaders. Um, I'd ask them, what do you want to do when you grow up? I mean, what was the first question? And they knew what that meant. It was, okay, you're a SOC analyst now. Do you want to try pen testing? And that same methodology of what I did with the help desk person into the low-level analyst job, I'd let them go work on a pen test or the red team for a couple hours a week. Um, and it gives them that ability to where they're not going to get that any other place to go to. They're going to get, this is your job. Here, here's your goals. We'll do a review at the end of the year. If there's a job opening, then you can apply for it. Oh, but you don't have experience. We're, it's building that culture and keeping those. That's why when we look for people, I mean, I probably have... 20 people a month come across my desk looking for jobs. I send them out to our CISO roundtable and they're gone in like two yeah. days. Yeah. Even if the people don't have an open job record. Yep. And I get the same thing. I mean, people contact me. I get the same thing. People contact me for CISO positions. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you, know, I'm, you know, I love what I'm doing. So I'm not, I'm not interested in moving. But at the same yeah. time, we know so many... You know, but it's like you know, you don't run into uh, you know, you run into a lot of fellow systems. Yeah. And the same thing, they're growing, you know, and they're in mid level, and they're willing to take another challenging position. We do, we, we share all of that. So my uh, my brother works. I used to work also at the same company he works, which is an IT outsourcing insourcing company, and their whole team of both teachers. Uh, division leaders and senior architecture and senior technical experts for the whole organization. Almost every single one used to be on the They have fantastic vertical and lateral movement in that company and a fantastic team spirit. And it really works. I think we should, as you said, the holy grail. We need yeah. to do this in security systematically. Well, I mean, I, th I look at it as it's the easiest thing to get to. Right. To get to start. <laughs> slide. You could progress from help desk up to senior architect. There was no vertical advancement in there that I could see. You could not, through your mentoring, through your skill analysis. Well, those three right there, the uh, those three, uh, you know, those three, you know, blocks. Yeah. They actually come off the uh, the path of CISO article that I published about a month ago. I think it's on uh, Peerless. That actually has the full one. That's only a piece of it. If you look at that article, it'll have the full path. All right. You know, I actually can put it down. So how would you measure someone who, who says to you in a one-on-one, -on -one, I want your job, and he's technical, and he needs to be even better technical. He wants your job. He wants to do the business. I go ahead and I explain to him, okay, you're going to need to start volunteering for projects, projects outside of security. All right? Because, you know, IT may have projects. You know, DevOps may have projects. Operations, HR may have projects, and a lot of them have some type of risk or some type of technical piece. A volunteer to be on that project. You don't have to be in charge, but you want to be on that project. So you start getting face time, start getting experience with things outside of IT. That starts showing leadership. And what you'll find is a lot of senior leadership see people who are doing that. You know, and they, they will actually give you opportunities to start growing that side. And that's where you start learning the, the business software piece. Because all of a sudden you've got to explain technology issues to people who are seriously not technical. Yeah. And, and if you start getting way down in the weeds, they're going to ignore you. You can't have that. So you honestly have to challenge yourself and figure out, okay, 
how do I break this down so they understand so we can be effective and get things done? And it is you, that's that's what you need to do. You got to you got to get outside of your comfort zone. I have to go to Toastmasters as one. Well. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Learn how to speak publicly. I've, yep. I've, I've, I've known been, several. I've got several that are doing Toastmasters or doing you know several other professional organizations so they can get comfortable in front of people. So on the job side, like what we're launching, should there be a specific section for soft skills also that you force people to fill out? And should you have them here? Product stuff, blending soft skills is very important. Should you have your peers? No, I don't have it. <laughs> should you have an option to ask your peers to come to the soft skills? Well, the problem is it's all subjective. Yeah. Right? So yes. like what you yeah. very considered soft skills, you know, it might be that he might be comfortable with somebody being a jerk. Because that's the you know the environment. Macy might need somebody to be a lot softer. You know, yeah. Just depends. Anyone have any, any more questions? I think that was. Thank you very much, guys. I think that's okay. Let's get, let's get it. Let's get it. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, small token of the Before anyone leaves, I've got a few practical notes. Uh, as you probably saw from this agenda, we have the next two full days of full of content. And if you should have more questions to ask Gary later, he's on pills. He has a thread for this book. So That's you can right. just go there and ask some questions. So please feel free to join us over the next two days for a lot of good things going on. And you can take the agenda. I'm the next speaker. <laughs>